Happy Friday, sophomores. I hope you guys are doing super duper. Uh, today is Aeneid Day, so uh, we're going to look at uh, books five and books five and six. Okay. Um, <clears throat> book five is uh, it's kind of a fun book. Um, a lot of uh, kind of lightheartedness going on. Um, and it's, uh, it's a little bit peculiar. It doesn't do a lot for the, the actual storyline, but it does kind of provide some relief between, um, the sorrow of, uh, book four with, um, Dido and all that. Um, and then the just kind of weightiness of book six with going down to the underworld. So, um, book five is kind of a little bit of a, more of a lighthearted sort of book. Um, just got a lot of fun to it. Uh, so, book five, uh, the main kind of thing going on here is um, they are, the Trojans are having some funeral games in honor of Aeneas's father, Anchises, okay? Um, so, it's, uh, Aeneas realizes it's been um, a year since his um, father had uh, died, so they are, he decides to hold some games um, to celebrate and, and honor him, okay? Um, so the first game they have, um, oh, and sorry, I forgot to, they, um, they did have another, there was a sign to where a, like, a snake comes out of, um, the, uh, an altar that was built, and, um, and, like, kind of slithers back harmlessly, um, so they, they take that as a good, a good sign, a good omen, all right, um, the first game they have is a, uh, a, a, a rowing race, um, a boat battle, not battle, sorry, a, a race, and, um, there are, there are four ships, and, um, there's, a <laughs> there's some, some fun parts in here, one of the, uh, one of the guys gets angry with his, uh, his, uh, um, steer, steersman, um, and he, like, throws him overboard, um, it's kind of fun, uh, and then, uh, it's, there's a, there's a close battle, um, but one of the, um, captains of the ship prays to, uh, prays to Neptune, and, um, he is kind of, uh, propelled on to, uh, to victory, so, um, there's a, there's a little bit of, um, a little bit more than just, uh, just skill going on in the boat race, um, and then Aeneas, uh, he gives, um, pretty awesome gifts to, to all the, um, captains and everything, and even those that didn't do so well in the race, um, he still, he still honors them. Alright, uh, and then the next game they have is a foot race, um, and this one is, um, the, the guy that's in the lead is a guy named Nisus, you may remember we had a translation about him way back in Latin 1, um, and he's going to show up later on in the story as well, um, but Nisus is, um, definitely, uh, he's in the lead on this, on this race, but then he, uh, he slips up in a pile of blood and guts, and, uh, because, you know, they're, they're busy sacrificing, you know, honor the gods and all that, uh, and he slips in this pile of blood and guts and loses his first place, but, um, Nisus has a, um, friend, um, named Euryalus, who is in, um, he wasn't second place, but he was right behind the second place guy. So what Nisus does is he trips up the next place guy so his friend, um, Euryalus, can win. All right. Um, so Euryalus ends up being the, the victor. Um, but once again, Aeneas um, gives rewards and honors to, to those that... Um, competed even if they didn't win um win first place all right um and then the next game they have is uh is a boxing match all right 
And um, this one is, this one is interesting. There's a um, fellow, a Trojan named uh, Dares, and he is um, very skilled, very talented um, boxer. Um, but there's a uh, a guy that lives on Sicily because remember they're in they're in Sicily right now. Um, named Entellus and Acestes, the king there in Sicily, um, encourages Entellus to, um, to take on Dares, and Entellus was a kind of renowned boxer back in the day, but he is, he's past his prime, um, he's getting, he's pretty old, relatively speaking, um, so he's not as, not as quick, and, um, I don't know a lot about boxing, but um, with boxing, a lot of it is strength, but there's a lot of it is uh, quickness as well. So Entelus has lost a lot of that quickness that you need, the agility you need um, in, in boxing, okay? So these two, uh, one young buck and one old guy, <laughs> go, uh, go into the boxing uh, ring together um and uh, they have a, a good good fight going on for a while um and neither can seem to really um get the proverbial upper hand um they they spar and everything and um Entelus, uh when he's going for one of his uh strokes he he goes so hard he loses his balance and uh he falls falls down to the ground and he's very embarrassed and humiliated by this and when he gets up he manages to take it out on dares and he just starts wailing and pummeling uh the young guy and um the it gets so bad that they had to had to pull him off and and Entelus is um, is declared the victor, and Dares has to go uh, um, get carried off in the proverbial stretcher. Um, so Entelus is is the victor, and uh, the prize for winning this boxing match was a, a really nice bowl. And um, Entelus, just to prove his strength and uh, what he could have done to Dares, is he just punches the brains out of this bowl just because he can he just is one punch he just crushes it um and uh it's a it's a rather rather interesting little uh episode all right um the next game they have is uh is kind of an archery contest um so you have several different uh guys line up for for archery um, one guy, uh, misses the mark, hits in the, the pole that they, uh, had set up. Um, another guy breaks the, um, oh, what's it called? Sorry, the, uh, little string that's holding the, the dove that they're shooting at. Another guy actually hits the dove, but then there's a Kestis who has, who has agreed to, um, to join in on this little competition. And Akestes, that since the mark has already been hit, um, he, uh, he decides, you know what, I'm gonna shoot my arrow anyway. Um, and this is an interesting bit. His arrow actually um, just bursts into flame in midair. Um, and uh, again, they, they view this as, as a sign from, from the gods. Um, so Akestes is kind of named Victor, even though he didn't hit the target, but, uh, the gods, uh, favored him. Um, and then the last of the, the games is kind of like a, a mock, uh, cavalry battle where the young kids, uh, relatively speaking, um, they, uh, do some of these kind of like military exercises and everything and go through, little battle routines and all that sort of thing. Um, and it's a great, a lot of fun for the kids, a lot of fun for their parents. You know, they all look, look spiffy. Um, and that is, uh, that is the last of the games, but, uh, the book does not end there. 
um, there is a, something else that goes on that is not so happy. Um, and this involves um, a, lot of the, a lot of the Trojan women who are um, rather upset that um, they have been wandering for years and years and still haven't set down roots, so haven't set down a home. And um, they just, they start complaining. And um, Jupiter, excuse me, not Jupiter, Juno, Juno sends Iris down, and Iris disguises herself, and she just really works these ladies up into a frenzy. And um, she starts burning the ships, all right? Um, and this is, this is not good. Okay, they should start burning the ships because they don't they want to sail anymore. And uh, Aeneas uh, catches wind of this, you might say, um, and he and the rest of the Trojans um, rush down. And he prays to Jupiter, and Jupiter sends a nice thunderstorm and puts out the um, the fire. All right, um, but in the meantime, they have lost a couple ships, and some have been damaged. Uh, so it's not not a good situation, uh, and this has given given Neus a lot of um, pause to think about what's going on, and he decides that um, through some counsel um, by a guy named uh, Nautes, I believe, um, he decides that hey, some of these people, if they're too old, too tired um, to continue on the journey, um, they can stay here in Sicily. Um, and Acestes agrees he will, um, he will watch out for them. Um, but the rest are going to um, continue on their, um, their journey. Okay? Um, and there's some, uh, there's some good, good lines in here. Um, one of them from Nautes, who kind of gives Aeneas this counsel that let the, the older, tired people stay. Um, he says, this is line 919, he says, Sir, born of an immortal, let us follow where our fates may lead, or lead us back. Whatever comes, all fortune can be mastered by endurance. All right. Um, so do what the fates tell you um, and keep, keep pressing on. All right. Um, so the, uh, the, the Trojans uh, continue their journey. Um, and Venus uh, goes to Neptune, asking him for um, a safe passage for the for the Trojans. And there's this weird bit. Um, Neptune agrees, but he has um, he has his price, and he says um, one person basically one person has to die. Um, so at the end of book five, um, we have another death. And this is uh, a fellow named Palinurus, who is the kind of the pilot of Aeneas's ship. Um, he falls overboard um, in the middle of the night. Um, so, yeah, that is how book five ends. Um, and kind of, again, shows a capriciousness, the pettiness of some of the gods. Um, this time, Neptune He's just like, yeah, just uh, kill one guy off here and I'll, I'll give you safe passage. All right. Um, so that is the end of, uh, end of book five. Um, book six. Now this is a very, uh, peculiar book. Um, and I'll, I'll admit there's a lot in book six. I don't understand. Um, there's a lot going on. Um, and this book six is a look at, uh, the underworld and, um, some of, uh, you can see some of the Romans views on, on this. And again, this is not necessarily, um, typical of all Romans ever, but at least, um, some Romans, this is how they, they viewed the underworld. Um, and this book is particularly important, um, in, uh, when you guys read Dante, um, in 12th grade, uh, when you read like the Inferno, um, Dante used uh, and borrowed from Virgil very, very heavily. Um, well, actually, a lot of authors did, but um, Dante very directly in a, in a lot of his descriptions and everything of hell. Um, okay, so um, book six, they reach, uh, the, the Trojans reach Italy, okay? Um, and they reach uh, an area 
near um, Kumai, a uh, settlement there. Uh, and let's see here, line 13, you can see Aeneas again described as duty-bound. Okay, so he has to fulfill his duty, fulfill his destiny. Okay, um, and they encounter the Sibyl, who is a uh, kind of a prophetess of Apollo. Um, and she, um, she's a very peculiar uh, character. If you read her, her descriptions, it's a uh, very um, interesting. Um, and she kind of has, um, she's kind of gets overpowered and goes into like these trance like things um, from the power of uh, the god. Um, okay, and she, um, she gives, um, Aeneas some counsel and, um, tells him how, how he needs to proceed. Um, and he, Aeneas asks her, there's a, again, kind of showing this role of fate, um, and what, um, Aeneas is looking for, um, line 105, he says, most holy prophetess foreknowing things to come. I ask no kingdom other than fate allows me. Let our people make their settlement in Latium uh, with all Troy's wandering gods and shaken powers. Okay, so again, asking no kingdom other than fate allows. Um, and then the, um, the Sibyl uh, gives him some, uh, some guidance and um, some counsel. A famous line then on 160, let's see here, 163, um, Aeneas says to her, uh, this is before they go into the underworld, teach me the path, show me the entrance way. Uh, it's a, a very famous, um, famous line here. Okay. Now, um, the Sibyl tells um, Aeneas that there is something he has to do, um, something he has to retrieve before he can enter the underworld, okay? Um, and he has to go and retrieve a, um, a golden branch, a golden bough that is um, to be sacred to uh, Proserpina, the uh, goddess of the underworld. Um, and you may remember that story about Proserpina getting abducted um, by Pluto all right, and taken down to be, um, to be his bride, okay? Um, so he, uh, he manages to get this branch. Um, he sees some doves in the, in the woods and he follows after them and um, he finds it in a, in a nice grove. He finds this golden tree, okay? Um, all right, and then he, uh, he goes with the Sybil, and she, uh, is going to be his guide as he goes, um, through the underworld, okay? Um, and this is, uh, you get some, some very, uh, powerful and kind of frightening pictures of, um, of, of the afterlife here, and, uh, at least how, again, how some... Romans viewed these things, all right? Uh, so they, one of the, the places they, uh, they come to is um, Acheron, okay? Um, and this is a kind of like a, a river or a, yeah, I guess it's a river, that um, they have to cross in order to get to further on in the underworld. Um, and this is where you meet uh, the character Charon, um, who is a rather <laughs> unsavory guy. He is the, uh, he's the ferryman uh, that carries souls across this, um, across this river. And he is, uh, he's rather surprised to see um, someone that's not dead <laughs> in the underworld. Um, and he, um, he about, you know, tells Aeneas to get out of here. Um, but then Aeneas has the, uh, has the golden bow and he, um, he lets him on his little boat and Charon, um, ferries them, ferries them across the water. Okay. Um, and, 
one of the, uh, then there's lots of, lots of descriptions and everything. So I'm just going to get a couple of the kind of highlights in here. Um, Aeneas sees, um, a lot of people, but one of the, one of the people he sees is, um, is Dido. And he, um, he realizes that, uh, Dido has, has died, um, and has, uh, killed herself. And, um, oh, I apologize before we get to Dido. I'm so sorry. Um, he does encounter Cerberus, um, because, you know, I like dogs. So ha have to mention Cerberus. Um, so he, he does encounter Cerberus before he gets like into the underworld proper. So sorry about that. Um, so anyway, he encounters Dido, um, and he, he doesn't realize, uh, before he had gotten there, he, he never, if you remember when he left Dido, um, she was not dead yet. Um, not dead yet. Uh, so Aeneas, um, he, he hadn't fully realized that Dido had died because, you know, when he left, she was still alive. So he sees her in the underworld. He realizes what has happened. Um, and it's a very, uh, very sad, um, scene once again. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> he asks her this line, is it 616? He says, was I, was I the cause? Um, it's like, yes, Aeneas, you idiot, you were the cause. Um, and Dido is, um, very, very bitter towards him. And she turns, she literally gives him the cold shoulder. Um, cause she's dead, right? So, she's a cold shoulder. Um, and she turns back to her husband, Okay, her actual husband that she was actually married to, um, Sicaeus, but uh, who had gotten murdered by her brother, you may remember. All right, so she's kind of reunited with him in the underworld, and they can, you know, grieve together. Um, yeah, okay. So, goes on. He um, he sees uh, some other some other folks. He sees a guy named Deiphobus, uh, who was one of Priam's sons. Um, and, uh, he, um, yeah, he sees various Greeks and various, um, Trojans. The Greeks kind of, uh, are scared of him because they remember what a good, uh, great warrior he was. And, um, the, the Sybil kind of, um, encourages him to, um, move along through the underworld and not linger too long because, um, the primary reason they are kind of going down here was Aeneas, um, is going to speak with his father. So, um, they have to get to the, um, Elysian fields, um, where his father is. Um, and the Elysian fields, as you probably know, these are, um, the fields where the the blessed people, uh, those that were, um, lived a good life. It's where they reside. All right. But before they get there, they do, he does pass, um, pass by Tartarus, where is like the, where the worst of the worst go, um, and are punished. And, um, Tartarus is where, you know, the, the Titans are kind of, um, in, uh, not enslaved, but, um, what's the word, um, in, in, imprisoned, I guess, would probably be the, the, the best way of putting it, um, and Tartarus is, is a pretty awful, horrible place, um, but eventually, he, uh, he reaches these Elysian fields, the, or, uh, blessed groves, and, um, he, he finally, he finally meets up with his father and his father, um, does something rather interesting. They do have their, they talk for a little bit. Um, but his father gives him kind of a vision of, um, what is to come. Okay. And, um, this is, uh, this is, is a rather interesting, uh, kind of interchange because what, um, he does is he tells him about the future history of Rome, 
okay, and some Roman heroes and Roman figures that are, um, from Virgil's standpoint, they are history, they are uh, people of the past, um, but obviously from Aeneas's standpoint, um, these people have not yet lived. So um, it's a very kind of interesting um, vision that he gives um, Aeneas. So Aeneas gets to see things that are not have not happened yet, but from Virgil's standpoint and from the reader's standpoint, these are um, these are historical events and historical people. Okay, um, so this is a, a very um, it's an interesting thing, and what it kind of does is it gives Aeneas um, uh, kind of the importance and a vision for um, what he is doing. Um, all right, and a uh, couple of the uh, just pointing out a few of the the people that he he mentions. Um, you obviously get Romulus, uh, the legendary founder of. Um, of the Romans, uh, you get some of the early kings as well. Um, you get Caesar. He talks about Caesar, and then Caesar Augustus, um, and Caesar Augustus. Remember, was the one in power when Virgil was writing. Um, so he tends to paint Caesar Augustus in a very good light, um, for the most part. Some people debate it, but generally, he is usually painted very very well. Um, and, uh, then you get some others, you get some early Roman heroes, um, you get the guy, uh, Camillus, um, he's a well-known, uh, Roman hero, you get, um, let's see here, Paulus, you get the Scipios, uh, you may remember Scipio Africanus defeated Hannibal, all right. Um, the Fabians, um, Fabius Maximus, also uh, famous for during the Carthaginian Wars. All right. Uh, and then you have, uh, here's, a, here's a very famous line here. This is lines 11, 53, 54. Um, actually, sorry, I'll back up a little bit. Um, he says, uh, 1151, Roman, remember by your strength to rule Earth's people, for your arts are to be these. All right, and then this is it's important here. To pacify, to impose the rule of law, to spare the conquered, battle down the proud. Okay, so have mercy on those that are, that are conquered, but those that are arrogant and proud, you know, beat the... Beat the daylights out of them. All right. Um, and then uh, you get another figure named uh, Marcellus. Okay. And um, he is pointed out at, at some length here. Um, and Marcellus was a, uh, a nephew, a son-in-law and destined heir of Augustus who died um, fairly early. So um, Virgil kind of um, kind of honors him as well in this in this scene, okay. Um, and then they leave the underworld, all right. And there are two gates uh, through which spirits leave the underworld. One of them is a gate of horn, okay. Um, and it's said that. Um, the true shades pass with ease, okay? The other one is ivory, um, and it says false dreams are sent through this one by the ghost to the upper world, all right? So you got these two gates, um, and Aeneas, interestingly enough, goes through this ivory gate, all right? So um, this is caused a lot of debate, and um, I honestly don't know entirely how to interpret it. Um, so w this whole scene, it kind of casts a shadow, I guess you could say, on this whole encounter in the underworld. Like, what does it even, what does it even mean? Um, and why is he going through this gate that the, uh, the, the false dreams are sent through? Um, 
so it's a it's an interesting one it's something to ponder again i don't have i don't have all the answers but it's uh definitely something to uh, think about um all right and that's kind of the conclusion of book six again i apologize book six uh there's a lot going on there there's a lot a lot of references a lot of things um and i understand some of them but there's a lot i don't so um if you have questions let me know um and i can i can look something up for you um but the um, the journey through the underworld is an important part in epic um, poetry. It's an important part for a hero uh, kind of prove and show his worth. Um, so it's it's a very common feature in, of epic poetry. All right. Um, okay, so we'll do books seven and eight for um, next Friday. All right. Uh, again, let me know if you have any questions though on on five and six, and if I can answer them, <laughs> I'll I'll try. Um, uh, and make sure that you uh, do those two reading checks and the two um, discussion posts. Okay. And again, on the discussion posts, make sure you're putting something um, from yourself, and then make sure you're commenting on on someone else. Um, and do please make sure you're trying to try to add to the conversation. Don't just be like huh, I found it interesting that, uh, you know, Neptune likes fish, okay? I mean, you try to give something substantial, all right? Um, and if you have a question about something, try to make it somewhat substantial, okay? Um, all right, and uh, Monday, Monday we'll have our vocab quiz, okay? So um, be preparing for that. And uh, I also have a um a little assignment for you on on monday um i mean i'll put it up this weekend but it'll be be due on monday that's on um some justive noun clauses and everything okay um it'll be it'll be short it shouldn't take you very long at all okay so let me know again if you have any questions and uh love you all hope you have a great weekend